So, Angelise, I'm, I'm more comfortable down here with the TradFi crowd. <laughs> Having been in this industry for 40 some odd years myself, it's all been TradFi. So, for both you and then also for Anthony, how do your business models fit into this ecosystem? Well, we're both blockchains, so blockchains really are not as fee generative. Um, we have a token, so um, having been in the TradFi world for so long, it, it makes me giggle a little bit that now I have, there's a liquid token, we have a cryptocurrency. So KDA is our token. And generally um, we don't, we get such a small fee for any transactions that are done, but we also have a large treasury and we would like more people to build on us. And so we encourage, uh, we actually will help pay, we give grants out for people to build and use our chain. And then the more transactions and the more um, activity that happens on chain is generally reflected in our treasury. If so that makes sense. So it, we're not really paid. It's, it's very interesting. It is not a what you would look at as a revenue generating uh, company. Uh, but it is sense. profitable. It's a for profit company, though. We do, we're for profit. Yes. A lot of blockchains have foundations. I don't know if Anthony Anthony does. Yeah. Um, and so he can talk a little bit about that. We just structured as one company. We have multiple different companies within our company. But yes. So, Anthony, your similar the, business? The, the traditional model of a layer one blockchain is a group of developers come together, they think of a new way to build a blockchain, something that has an attributes that existing blockchains don't. They go out and they build the tech, they do an ICO, and they say, oh shit, maybe we just issued securities. So they incorporate a foundation into Switzerland and they say, you guys are responsible for all that security stuff now, and then they go off and they, they continue to build. Not a great model. Obviously, the SEC had its list of uh, layer ones that they think or thought were securities. It added a, a layer of uh, you know, confusion, certainly, into the industry. It wasn't the right way to go about doing it. That being said, there is no way to construct a public blockchain in the current environment that the SEC has. For instance, if you run a blockchain, you need to pay your validators in your token. That's the way you get a cryptographically true uh, network. And if you know securities law, you can't pay non-broker dealers in securities. So you can't say all tokens are security. So there just is no construct available for, for layer ones um, today. But uh, you know, to take a big step back, so all financial services networks, whether it's credit cards or custody banks or my old business depository banks, uh, you have an oligopoly of providers inevitably evolves due to regulatory and compliance and interoperability. So, yeah, you know, think about you know, Visa, Mastercard, or BNY Mellon, and Northern Trust, and State Street, and custody. I think we're going to wind up with a very small number of public blockchains that register, ledger, and exchange the world's financial assets. And when I say register, ledger, and 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 exchange, it's important to to think about that because the credit card networks are messaging networks. Swift is a messaging network. Uh, DTC is a settlement network, right? So mapping all these things. Blockchains can do custodians or sort of layer twos and layer threes. And if you think about, you know, TradFi, you have the credit card networks, you have the bank and issuing banks and brokers, you have the custodians, you have the DTCs. You know, those are all layers of a network. But most public blockchains, if constructed in the right way, they can encompass all those functions at the layer one blockchain level. So it does have the ability to do away with all those intermediaries. And all those intermediaries in TradFi exist because you need to bring trust into the system. I could sell you 100 shares of Amazon, you could pay me $100, but how do I know you're gonna give me the $100 and how do you know I'm gonna give you the Amazon shares? Well, if we had a distributed ledger, we could actually fulfill that trade right here on stage instantly. We don't need a T plus three, T plus two, introducing broker dealers, custodians, DTC. We don't need all those people involved in our trade. We could face off bilaterally. And that's the promise of blockchain. And you could do that across all asset classes. Now, also important to know that Securities will never be you know, the Bitcoin dream of anonymous and decentralized. Like, you're always going to know who's securities. You're always going to have to be able to claw it back. These are not bearer instruments. You can't lose your keys. So you have to overlay all that when you think about crypto. So blockchain, you know, like, is, it, is blockchain crypto, is crypto blockchain? Yeah, they're inter-reliant on each other and they need each other, but they're very separate from a, a, an operational construct. And maybe Annalise, just staying with us for a moment. So you talked about uh, intranet versus internet. Uh, if the dust settles five years from now, the world does need 50, 100, thousands of different blockchains, I don't think, especially in financial services, because if I'm going to port my assets from one platform to the other, but these two blockchains are dramatically different, how do I do that? So there's got to be some standards, I would think. So how many blockchains are there in financial services? And do you see us sort of circling the wagons around a smaller number? Absolutely, but there's probably a thousand blockchains, but there's probably maybe 
Uh, I don't know that we could even, I couldn't name off 100. Um, Too many. Yeah, but I, do, but, I, but I do think there's a smaller fraction that are working in the regulated traditional finance idea. Uh, there's very, you know, there's not that many public, and then there's a lot of layer twos that are built on top of, say, Ethereum, which is the main one. That because Ethereum, Bitcoin, you can't actually program on top of. You can program on top of Ethereum. So that's that was the real benefit when it came out is that you can have, in essence, a, a totally programmable bond that pays when it's supposed to pay. Um, so that's kind of the difference between the two. Um, there's interoperability as well. So I think you have to have standards. For example, I started at Cadena a couple months ago, which was built by JP Morgan guys, kind of for finance, and then they were just tech guys that were creative because, as, as Anthony said, you just had you know tech guys building really cool tech. Um, but the idea of kind of putting some sort of some sort of business behind that, well, we're not EVM compatible, which means we can't talk to Ethereum. So now you know, we'll be EVM compatible soon because that is a standard that we need to have to operate within the ecosystem. So I don't think being, no one can be an island. I mean, in business, no one is an island that is very successful, right? But similarly in blockchain, I do think it will narrow down because different chains are also generally identify themselves in different ways. So a lot of public chains have a large crypto component to them. And so they, this chain creates meme coins, for example, and maybe this coin is, this chain is more NFT focused. So I don't think, even though there's so many chains out there, they're not really built for settlement of securities or bonds. So I do think, yes, there'll be a number of chains. I think it's not gonna be one. Um, I think it'd be more like 10-ish. Um, but I do think there's huge benefits to private chains, which we can come to later, which is like the private, the um, stable coins that you guys have internally. 